You bought a wood lathe, but maybe you haven't made anything with it yet. Maybe you're a little intimidated and you don't know where to start. No problem. Today, you are going to finish your first wood turning project. We're going to start at ground zero and take you all the way through this foot massager. It is a perfect beginner project that you can get done in just a couple of hours. Let's start by picking the wood. I'm starting with a piece of walnut, but any hardwood will do. Your piece should be about an inch and a half square, and you can just glue up some scraps if you need to. Finding the center of a square or rectangle is easy. You just connect the corners, and where the lines cross, that's your center point. Mark your center with an awl, and we'll prep the wood for the spur center. This part goes in the lathe headstock to drive your work. It's got a center point and four big wings. Dig into the wood to spin it. Lots of people just drive the spur center into the work, but there's a better way. Take a fine saw and make a pair of shallow cuts along your pencil lines. These cuts will give the spurs an easy place to grab the wood. I also drill a hole right in the middle, so the point can go in easy and not get in the way of the spurs. You only need to do this to one end. For the other end, just find center. You can take square wood straight to the lathe, but spindle turning is easier if you knock off the corners first. I'm using a heavy set hand plane, but lots of people do this on the table saw, which is quick and saves you time at the lathe. Over at the machine, we need to set the speed, and most lathes have a chart to help you with that. To start out, we want the slowest speed, so we want the smallest pulley on the motor side and the biggest pulley on the spindle side. Notice how all the pictures show the belt staying parallel and only connecting pulleys that are across from each other. Never put the belt at an angle. It's not meant to run that way. Don't cross the streams. On my lathe, the belt tensioner is right here. The knob unlocks the motor so it can move up and down. The lever lifts the motor and I lock it in the up position so there's no tension on the belt. The belt goes on the little pulley at the motor and the big pulley at the spindle. I release the motor and put firm pressure on the lever as I lock it back down. This gives you plenty of belt tension and you can check that by just pushing on the belt. It should feel pretty tight. Your spur center goes in the headstock, and your live center goes in the tailstock, and your machine is set up. Mounting the wood is easy. The end we prepared fits into the spur center, and I hold that in place while I bring up the tailstock. I lock the tailstock to the bed and advance the quill until I have medium pressure on the workpiece. I spin the piece by hand to make sure everything looks good, and then I lock the quill. I'm ready to turn. For this beginner project, I am using easy carbide tools. They're ready to cut right out of the package and they don't require sharpening. The other option for tools is traditional high-speed steel turning gouges like this one. Now, if terms like carbide and high-speed steel get your head spinning and you get confused, don't worry. I've got a book for that. It's called One Week to Wood Turning, and it's my complete guide to all the gear of getting set up for turning. It takes you through the lathe, the tools, sharpening, finding wood, finishing, setup, safety, everything. You can pick the book up on Kindle, on Amazon, or you can go to rexkruger.com slash store and grab a totally unrestricted PDF that you can read on any device and that'll get you going. Now for this project, we are going with these carbide tools, and for these, it's really important to set the height of your tool rest. Since carbide tools work using a scraping action, they need to be right around the center line of your work. This is too low. I'm way below center. This is about right. I've got my face shield on, and I'm going to stand away from the work while I turn the lathe on. Nothing went flying, and the piece is turning smoothly. I can put my tool on the rest and gently advance into the work. I get a cut right away, and there's really nothing to it. I'm just taking this rough piece and making it into a cylinder. With this square-tipped tool, I can slide back and forth if I'm taking a light cut, but I'll get faster results if I take little bites, feeding the tool in a little bit, then stopping and repeating. When the piece is mostly round, I go back to sliding the tool for a smooth finish. When half my piece is round, I move the tool rest and start working on the other half. I always make my spindle projects extra long. This one is long enough for two foot massagers. If I make a mistake, I'm already set up to make another one, and I won't waste any time. Speaking of mistakes, watch what happens right here. That's called a catch. The tool dug in hard enough to keep the piece from spinning. I don't have the wood held really tightly, so the spur center just slips a little bit and nothing bad happens. Catches happen to everyone, and generally they're more scary than dangerous. But when I get a catch, I try to pay extra attention. I think my tool is a little bit too low, so 
I'll bring the rest up a little bit before I keep turning. Once I've got a cylinder, I can lay out my project. I need about five inches of material, so I'll mark that with a dull pencil. It leaves a nice thick line. When I turn the lathe on, I can still see my mark, and I'll hold the pencil to the work for a clear layout line. I'll do the rest of my layout by eye. I want about a half inch at either end, and the rest of it will just be divided into narrow details called beads. So I'll make a center mark, and then just keep dividing the remaining space in half until I have a bunch of layout lines. Now, I can use the diamond detail tool to make a deep groove at each of my lines. This tool gets caught pretty easily, so feed it in slowly and don't twist it. Now that I'm done with the roughing out, I moved up my speed two steps to 1400 RPM. Faster speeds will give you a smoother finish and less chipping. You need a fast speed to do details like these. Once all those grooves are done, I'll switch to my round-tipped tool and feed it straight into those grooves, turning those hard corners into smooth roundovers. This is also a good tool for general shaping, so I'm going to go back and forth on the piece, forming a fat bead at either end and slowly shaping the middle so it's thick in the center and tapers at the ends. You might find the square tool works better for general shaping. It's okay to switch tools and experiment. There's lots of ways to do this right. After I've shaped it, I need to go back to the diamond tool and deepen the grooves on the ends. I like the general shape, but the little beads in the middle are too flat, the edges are too sharp, and they're too small for the round tool to fit in there. This is where you need to get a little bit creative. The corner of my square tool fits perfectly into those grooves, and I can swing the handle around to make a nice, smooth curve. I work my way all the way down the piece, swinging the handle to round over each little detail. Sanding is easy on the lathe. I just fold the paper so I can get into all those little details. Just make sure you keep the paper moving so you don't get a flat spot on the work. It all looks great while the machine is running, but when I stop the lathe, I see that the finish is very rough. The wood has chipped a lot, and I'm not gonna be able to sand all that damage out. Looking at the piece, I can see that walnut was the wrong choice, especially for these carbide tools. They cut with kind of a scraping action, and they work better with denser woods. Walnut's a hard wood, but it's not very hard, and it's not right for this project. This is fine. Learning experiences like this are only going to make you better at turning, and I'm just going to switch wood. For my second try, I'm switching to maple, a dense, close-grained wood that's much less likely to splinter and chip. Same as before, I use the square tool to make a cylinder, and then I lay out my project. This time, I want to use my round tool, so my details can't be too close together. By using the tool as a spacer, I get my layout lines exactly right. You can see that I've shaded the ends of the piece, and the middle is just going to be a series of round parts. Those are the beads, and in between them will be round depressions, called coves. I'm gently feeding my round nose tool straight into the work not too deep. Once I have my cove started, I work on the sides of the detail, using a small part of the tool and widening the cove before sweeping through the cut in one smooth motion. You don't want to bury the whole tool in the wood when you can avoid it. Taking a light cut with a small part of the edge will give you a cleaner finish with less friction. I'll keep doing this to every other section of the project until I have four coves. Then I'm going to turn the remaining wood into beads. It's handy to put a center line in the middle of each bead. You can just eyeball it. To form the detail, start at your center line, and then push gently down into the cove you already cut. Then, do the same thing on the opposite side. Leave your layout line in the middle until the detail is close to being done, and you can sweep your way across the whole thing in one fluid motion that smooths it out and erases the line. Making these details is pretty easy, and you'll get the hang of it fast. The project is going fine, but it looks totally boring. The details are round and lumpy, and there's no separation between them. This detail tool lets me come in between each bead and make a sharp little crease. That will give me some light and shadow on the finished project and add a lot of visual interest. The corner of the square tool lets me get into those details and blend them smoothly into the beads while also cleaning up the surface and taking out some tool marks. I finish up by adding a couple of shallow lines to the ends and the middle. These little details make the piece a lot more interesting. And you don't have to plan anything. I'm totally improvising. Sanding this piece is easy. I just keep the paper moving and don't stay too long in one spot. Folding it gives me a sharp corner for getting into those tight details. I got a pretty good finish off the tool, so I'm just using 150 grit and stopping there. I want the piece to be easy to get off the lathe, so I'm going to turn down the end and just leave a little bit of wood. 
maybe half an inch. Then I'll finish sanding those details. You can leave the piece unfinished, but you can also use any wood finish you have laying around the shop. Wipe on polyurethane is nice because it's thin and it soaks in fast. I'm just going to slather on a bunch of finish and then turn the lathe on and hold the paper towel against the wood to spread it around. Then I switch to a dry paper towel, put the lathe on its highest speed and press firmly. I'm trying to build up friction here because it heats up the finish and makes it dry almost instantly. Note that I'm only using paper towels for the finishing. If the lathe grabs these, they'll just tear. A cloth rag can get caught and pull you into the work. Never bring a cloth rag to the lathe. To get the project off the lathe, I just use a fine pull saw and rotate the work as I cut. Doing it this way gives you an even cut, and if you do it right, you can knock the piece right off the machine and onto your concrete floor. Or you could be more careful than me and not drop your work. There's no right way. I ended up making three of these, just experimenting with shapes and trying out different techniques. The wood for these projects is pretty much free, so you might as well experiment. The maple one doesn't just look the best, it's also the most comfortable, especially after a whole day standing around on concrete. These things look like a gimmick, but they actually work, and they're a perfect way to practice skills that you'll need later. If you pick a simple project like this, you really can finish your first wood turning project today. And if you do a simple thing like the foot massager, well, it opens up a lot of possibilities because these are furniture details. If you just took this and made it longer, it could be a table leg or a chair leg. This is going to get you into the kind of wood turning that's going to let you make real pieces that you're going to want to show off or maybe even sell. <laughs> Who knows where it'll go? Now, if you haven't even bought a lathe yet, don't forget to pick up one week to wood turning because it takes you through every piece, all the gear that you need to get going in this hobby. And if you want to see more of this kind of content, think about becoming a patron. My patrons get not just these videos early, but a lot of exclusive stuff, including the workbench sessions. It's an exclusive lecture series we do with some of the biggest names in the woodworking world. This month, we have none other than the wood whisperer himself, Mr. Mark Spagnolo. He's going to come and give us an exclusive hour-long interview. And the only people who get to see that ever our patrons. All my patrons get all the rewards for just $5 a month, and if you'd like to get in on that, go on over to patreon.com slash rexkruger and sign up. It's really easy. We're going to be back next week with another woodworking video, and we really hope you'll join us. Thanks for watching.